This is a very familiar story. This is something that we who have been a part of the faith, and if you're not a Christian, we've heard of. Maybe you've been a part of children's processionals as they walk in with palms. Maybe you were a part of fun dramas that happen. But this is a story that's very familiar to many of us. And we love familiar stories. Many of us have familiar stories in our own families. We have origin stories of how we maybe came to be in the United States. Maybe we have origin stories or stories of how our parents worked hard to create a living. And we have embodied those stories as well. We all have stories. We all have familiar stories. And there's stories that help orient ourselves and our lives to the world that we live. And this Palm Sunday message, this processional as Jesus is walking in and Jesus is coming in on a donkey and the shouts of Hosanna, this is an orienting story for our faith. It's a story that we use. It's a story that we can shape. It's a story where we emphasize certain portions of the story to get certain points across. And we do this with many stories that we tell. We highlight details and we leave out others that don't quite make our point. Meaning we can shape stories to fit our need. We have a knack of shaping images to make them do what we want. And I think we do this with Jesus. The story goes that God created us in his image. And in return, we decided to create God in our own image as a gift back. And what does this look like to create God in our own image? As we worship and as we pray, God tends to like all the same things we like. God tends to be for the people that we're for and against the people that we're against. God often always has grace for us when we confess, but God tends to have condemnation for those that don't quite operate in the way that we think they should. In the Gospels, we are given pictures and stories of a God who became in flesh, a God who experienced our humanity to bring our humanity to the Father. And these different Gospels give us different views of the same story, emphasizing different parts depending on the Gospel, but telling a unified story that God in Christ came, lived, died to bring humanity together as one so that we would be united, so that in return we can reflect who God is to the world around us who is watching us. It's the same story that through the death of God on the cross, wholeness, salvation, truth can now reign and unity comes. And now reconciliation comes somehow through the cross of Jesus and Jesus is vindicated through his resurrection. These are the images and stories we have, but often we like to control the image of Jesus. We like to highlight the parts we want and neglect the ones that we don't. It's a lot like having to take a family photo. How many of you have had to get your whole family together to take a family photo? It's the worst, right? You, you plan for months, you try to come up with a theme, you get all your like dress together, and then the day of, months leading up to this, nothing wrong happens, but the day of, everything goes wrong. Someone gets sick, you get something on your favorite outfit, you find out that you may have gained 10 to 12 pounds since that conversation and things aren't fitting as they should. Oh my goodness, so many things go wrong. A week before I was married, I went out with some of my groomsmen and we went paintballing, which is a really dumb idea. Because when you get shot with a paintball gun, um, it looks like you have a lot of little bruises all over your body. And at the end of the day, I was doing fine and I got shot in my left hand. And so in most of our photos, if you look by my ring finger, you can see a little spot. And the great thing is our wedding photographer was wonderful. She was able to edit out most of the photos and change it to make it look like I didn't, wasn't maimed for our pictures. But we, we can do that, right? If there's something you don't like about your photo, you can edit it. You can change it. You can put in filters. You can take away 15 pounds. You can take away an estranged family member if you want to, right? You can just take them out and it's like they were never there. You make someone taller, you can drop 20 pounds. You can brighten a day, you can take the clouds out. Again, we do this with Jesus. And today is Palm Sunday. 
and we are going to revisit a familiar story. And we are going to take a look at how we have often taken Jesus and we have molded Jesus to fit what we need. And how we have often co-opted Christ the Messiah for our agendas. And the Gospel of Mark has something to say to us today. And today, um, as my mom would say, gird up your loins, um, we're going to talk about politics. Oh, everybody, um, there's a deep sigh and a, and a trembling and yeah. Uh, trust me, I don't want to preach this. Uh, I don't want to do this at all. I don't want to preach about politics in the midst of a very highly contested political season that we're all entering and have entered. But for some reason, as I was writing this week, I just couldn't get away from it. And as a, a young-ish pastor in ministry, political seasons have not been the most fun to be preaching in. Before I came here to Illinois, I was a pastor in Maryland, and we were just north of D.C. for about 30 minutes. So all the things that happened within proximity to pastoring there had a lot to do with politics, had a lot to do with anything with the army, because a lot of our congregation worked in D.C., worked on the Hill, were in politics. And so one of the biggest things that I remember when I first moved there was on January 6th, something small happened at the Capitol. And it was disorienting for our congregation. People were mad. People were frustrated. And it was into that space that us as pastors, we had to speak. We had to stand. And we had to stand where Jesus stands. And we had to try to bring people who were pulling from the poles back to the center and back to the table to remind them that Jesus has to be more, that Jesus has to be enough to unite us. And it was a hard conversation. In 2022, um, my senior pastor was on sabbatical and we were in a series just called At the Movies. It was just meant to be a fun, light summer series where we could look at some of the common themes in popular movies and pull out some principles of what God is teaching us through what's happening even in current films. And during that time, Roe v. vs. Wade was overturned. And with our senior pastor gone and myself kind of leading in that stead, we were getting phone call after phone call. We were getting people who were happy. We were getting people who were upset. And we were getting people who wanted to hear from the church to speak into this space. And I was sitting there going, I'm gonna get fired. And so I called my senior pastor, which you're probably not supposed to do while they're on sabbatical. And he was out golfing, go figure, which is fine. It's what sabbaticals are for. And I called him and said, hey, I'm supposed to be preaching on Spider-Man this coming week. I can't do that. I can't talk about Spider-Man. I have to literally talk about the elephants in the room. And I said, this is what I'm going to talk about. And he said, okay. <laughs> Okay. And so I called up our elders and our board. I said, hey, um, this is either going to go really, really bad or on Monday you'll have my resignation. There's not really much in between. And as I got behind that pulpit and I started preaching and teaching, I just spoke to the tensions in our room. I spoke to the collective uncertainty and frustration into our congregation. And I called us to this ethos that we need to be able to disagree politically, but love each other unconditionally. That what we claim and we call as people of faith have to be enough to unite us. That if that isn't enough, then we don't really have any hope to offer a world that is completely divided. That if we can't unite enough around the thing that is the centrality of our faith, then I don't think we have anything to say. I wasn't fired, so here I am. But in 2016, I had to speak to this in a different way. And um, in 2016, I did have to resign. I spoke in a way that wasn't okay. I spoke in a way that hurt people in our congregation. I spoke in a way that instead of bringing people to the center, pushed them further to their poles. And so today, my prayer is that I don't push you to the poles, that I push you to Christ. And we move towards the center who is Jesus together. Nothing divides us in the church like politics. Nothing creates tension in our bodies and in the church like politics. And nothing makes a brother and a sister an enemy like politics. And I tend to avoid politics. Um, I'm not overly interested in it. Whenever 
whoever's speaking on MSNBC, Fox News, CNN, whenever they start to shame and blame, I'm done. I don't want to do with that. But this week on Tuesday, we had voting and we had a polling station here at the church. So I came to my office and I sat down and I looked to the right and there was people out voting. Can't really get away from that. So all throughout the day, I was watching people do their civic duty of voting to see who would decide to be the leader within our community and within our nation. And politics, they're not evil. Uh, Politics aren't evil. It's important to talk about who's fit for leadership. How do we govern this land that we live in? How do we care for those that are the most vulnerable among us? How do we educate each other Our young kids, how do we educate society together? How do we live in community as a just society? And all these different pieces fit into politics and they are absolutely necessary. Today, I don't want to talk about politics, but also today our text brings that question to the forefront. And with Jesus, there were people who wanted to co-opt who he was. And so I'm going to read that Mark passage one more time. And I want you to, as I'm reading it, think about our political climate. Think about the ways we are pulled into demonizing and othering other people that see the world differently than us. So let's read this again. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, And Bethany has the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you. And just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say the Lord needs it and we'll send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at the doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but it was already late. He went out to Bethany with the 12. Jesus was born into a time where God's people were longing for political liberation. They were wanting things to be different. And their context is not too far from the desires of our current context. They wanted their, they wanted their political reality to be different. They were under the oppression of the Romans. They were kind of like a nation state where they didn't really get to govern themselves properly. They were taxed to the nth degree and they had autonomy, but they didn't have autonomy. They wanted to go back to the days of David and Solomon, David who moved the capital to Jerusalem and Solomon who built the temple. And for many of us, the last eight years have been similar. If you land here, you've been unhappy about certain people in office over here. If you land here, you've been unhappy about certain people in office on this side. If we can just have someone different, if we can just have someone more like us, then maybe things would be better. And these were the beliefs that the people held dear. In this period, there was a common belief that God was going to come, that God was going to send a Messiah and the Messiah would come in and Messiah would clean house, would move out all of God's enemies, all the people who were causing the problems and God would set up his kingdom through Jerusalem and it would echo out as peace for the entire world, for all of creation. That was the expectation they had that maybe God would set things right. And they had an expectation that it was going to be political. They had an expectation that it was going to be a king, very similar to what Solomon and David were like. And so as the people are watching this Jesus come in, maybe they're asking themselves, why not Jesus? Why not someone who's been a miracle worker, who has healed? Why not someone who has caused disruption, that crowds are now starting to follow him? Why not this person who has healed those that have been sick? Why not someone who has authority over evil spirits? Why not this Jesus? Why can't this Jesus be the person? 
Jesus has done that, but we have an expectation of more. Maybe he is a reformer. Maybe he is the revolutionary. Maybe he will be the conquering hero. Maybe this Jesus is the new king. Why not this rabbi? And the backdrop for this encounter is ripe with imagery during the Passover, which reminds us of the Exodus, where God comes in to Pharaoh and empire is put on full display. Empire who uses power very improperly and God makes a spectacle. There are plagues and each plague has to do with each of the Egyptian God and their pantheon. And as God redeems his people and liberates, it's a grand cosmic event. It's something that has oriented the lives of the people where they know what liberation should look like and what it feels like because they have stories and histories and generations of those that have not felt what peace could and should look like. And I believe that this is exactly what people were expecting and hoping as they were shouting, Hosanna, God, save us. These Romans, they ain't it. We need something better. We need something more. They were wanting liberation from occupation to see Israel brought back to its proper place. But as they are shouting Hosanna, something about this humble king coming towards them starts to maybe shift their expectations, to shift their hope to maybe to something that's more uncertain. How can shouts of Hosanna turn to crucify him so quickly? In this story, we find Jesus isn't the king we want, but we find that Jesus is the king we need. And there's a few elements that Jesus coming into Jerusalem that strikes against the expectation of Jesus being the king they wanted. Jesus comes in on a donkey. I don't know about you, but donkeys don't really strike fear into my eyes. Like when I think of donkeys, I think of like Shrek. And that doesn't strike fear into my eyes. So a king coming in riding on donkey, I, I, it just doesn't do it for me. Because conquering kings don't ride beasts of burden. They ride war horses. They come in wielding swords. Conquering kings don't ask if they can borrow your donkey. They just take it. Jesus sent the two and said, hey, ask. And if someone says, I don't know, it'd say, I'll return it immediately. Something's wrong with this Jesus. Jesus is not a sword-wielding, army-raising king. He's the prince of peace. A common practice of peace was to ride a donkey at a procession, and peace in Jesus had come. Jesus could have chosen any animal, but he chose a donkey. And there's some rich history here for Mark, the Gospel of Mark, who's echoing a messianic hope, longing for something more. And he's longing from Zechariah 9, 9, where it says, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem, see your king comes to you righteous and victorious, yet lowly and riding on a donkey. It was to fulfill scripture that Jesus is king, but also to show the kind of king that Jesus is. Jesus isn't the warmonger that we want him to be. He doesn't come in on a chariot. He doesn't wield a sword. Jesus isn't going to raise up armies. Jesus is not going to conquer lands. Jesus comes as the prince of peace, slowly on a donkey. This isn't the king people wanted, but it was the king that they were going to get. And this procession should have ended with, grand, with a grand ritual or sacrifice. That's the expectation. An expulsion of former vestiges of power and then a banquet of celebration. That's not what we get. In verse 11, he enters the temple. He looks around and says... All right, it's too late. Let's go. Mark is kind of <laughs> underwhelming. This is not what I expect. This isn't what we should be expecting. Jesus, you have work to do. You have business to tend to. Things aren't right and you're going home. You're stepping away with your friends. The people were not expecting this. Hosanna, God save us from this high tax, from this Romans. But Jesus had other things in mind. 
I kind of wonder about the disciples during this time. The disciples who have been with Jesus have watched something very interesting happen. Every time Jesus would heal, he would remind the person being healed, shh, don't say anything. Don't do anything about this. Throughout Mark, there's something called the messianic secret where the idea of whose Jesus' true identity is, is held quiet. And then before this time, Jesus is also saying, guess what? I am going to be crucified. I will be enduring pain. And the disciples are hearing this and the crowds are gathering more and more and more. How many of you have ever anticipated something big before? You know what that feels like, right? Maybe it was on your wedding day. Maybe the birth of your first child where you're sitting there going, I hope they like me. I hope I don't break them. Why are they allowing me to take this child home? This makes no sense. Can we stay another night? Not like I would ever say that or did that, but we did. Insurance covered it. It was fine. But we know what it's like to expect something big. There's uncertainty. There's electricity in the air. We don't know what's going to happen. We have that not in our gut. We also have butterflies. We're not sure how they got there, but it's, we don't, there's a lot going on. And this is what the disciples were doing. This is what they were experiencing. They were told to be quiet. They were told not to share who Jesus was. But up until this point, they had heard that Jesus was going to be crucified. And now grand spectacle is happening and the secret is out. And as they're walking, they're looking to their left and they're looking to the right saying, what is going to happen here? People know, is he the king that they're saying he is? We've seen him do these things, but what kind of king is this Jesus? Can he be crucified? Is that what God does? Is that how God flexes his power as he dies on a cross? Or is there more? Can there be more? Should there be more? There were so many expectations, but Jesus had a mission in mind. Jesus' mission was to reconcile us. Jesus' mission was one of obedience, even to death on a cross. Jesus' mission was to name and proclaim that the kingdom of God was coming and had come through him. There are so many expectations, but the Jesus of the gospels does not allow us, does not allow the disciples, does not allow the people, does not allow the crowds of that first Palm Sunday to co-opt his mission, to name what Jesus would do or should do. Jesus didn't come to fulfill anyone's political agenda. And Jesus refuses to be co-opted for our partisan ties. One of the messages of Palm Sunday is that we have to be saved from our petty nationalism that divides the world into people who are for us and who are against us. Jesus is not the king we want, but Jesus can't be molded into our images. Jesus is not the king we want because Jesus can't be molded into our images. No, Jesus is not the king we want, but Jesus is the king we need. Jesus came to bring hope to humanity. Jesus came to bring peace to those who had not known peace. Jesus' death and resurrection unites humanity. It doesn't divide us, and we don't get to dictate who are the sheep and who are the goats. When it comes to this political season we are entering and have entered, we have to be careful as a church. The church called and given the ministry of reconciliation because for many of us, we want a Republican Jesus. That doesn't exist. We want a democratic Jesus. That doesn't exist. When we mold Jesus into these images and says, hey, there he is. This is where Jesus stands. This is who Jesus endorses. We are the ones that say, Hosanna. And a week later, we shout, crucify him. But instead of our words being pointed at Jesus, we point it at the person in the pew next to us. We say crucify to a brother and sister in Christ that sees the world differently than us. Even to the cross, Jesus was on a mission. Jesus' mission was to bring humanity to God. And we are called to echo that mission. On this Palm Sunday, our mission is to follow this king, this humble king who doesn't want to be co-opted, 
who refuses to pick up a sword, who loves and heals, who does cross boundaries, who looks over humanity from the cross and says, Father, forgive them. They just don't know what they're doing. This is who we are called to follow. The same Jesus gave us the ministry of reconciliation to create space where hope can abound, where people who are exhausted from the hate and the mudslinging can find rest in a community that chooses to live life just a bit differently. This Jesus calls us to greater unity in the midst of deep societal and political division. This is our commission. And walking towards Jerusalem was about uniting humanity to God. Dealing with the sin that separates and divides us to bring healing to our deep divisions. This Palm Sunday, I'm reminded of these truths of who Jesus is. Jesus doesn't come to wield a sword. He is the Prince of Peace. We can't use Jesus to divide people. We can't use Jesus as a weapon. Jesus doesn't allow that. It's not who Jesus is. Jesus isn't nationalistic. Jesus redeems and calls beyond the boundaries we set up. Jesus's mission was bigger. The people of God in that time, in that space, they wanted more. Who doesn't want liberation from oppression? We all do. Whenever oppression is on the scene, we want to see liberation happen. But Jesus had a bigger mission in mind. It was more. It was eternal. It was lasting where one day there will be no more tears or frustration that Jesus will be all in all. Jesus doesn't set people against one another. And lastly, Jesus isn't made in our image. We're entering a very hotly contested time where it's gonna be very easy to point to a neighbor and say, you're no longer my neighbor where we're gonna put it to people down the street that happens to have different political signs in their yard and say, you're not a part of us. You're not like me. But the thing is, we are in desperate needs of God's grace every single day. And we are in desperate need of being saved and reconciled. And the world is in desperate need of seeing a community of diverse opinions and understandings that sees the world very differently, but can come to the table united in Christ that our deep divisions don't have to keep us from calling our neighbor, our brother, and our sister. This Palm Sunday where Jesus says, I'm going to Jerusalem, and the shouts as we walk through this great epic go from Hosanna to, nah, I don't want him. Crucify him. He's not the king I want. Maybe Jesus isn't the king you want, but Jesus is the king you need, and Jesus is the king we need. Let's pray. Dear Lord, you know I didn't want to preach this. <laughs> Friends and family members, nothing has caused us more harm than often this topic and how we see the world, things that have been done to us, things that have been said to us, where thoughts and opinions take the front seat to relationships, um, where pat answers and quippy statements take the place of deep thinking. Um, God, we're really good at building walls against one another. We're really good at pushing people away that don't see the world the way we do. Um, God, we have a knack of doing that. Lord, I have a knack of being right, of seeing the world that, it, that, that the way I see it, it is the way. But that's just not the truth. And Lord, as a collective whole, Lord, we confess that we desperately need you. And as we start this holy week, as we start this season of deciding who will lead, who will govern, who is fit, Lord, let us do it with charitable discourse. Let us do it with kindness and let's do it with love. Lord, help us not to make other people the enemy because um, people are not our enemies. They're our neighbors. They're our brother and sisters. They're the people we go to work with who we drive next to. <laughs> They're the people that cut us off in traffic. <laughs> but God, they are worthy of our love. God, you brought us to God so that we, in return, can bring you to other people. You unite us. 
And Lord, my prayer is that what unites us is stronger than what can potentially divide us. That during these next couple months, that our community can be a place that people look to that go, huh, I guess that does exist still. That we can disagree and still come to the same table. Lord, your name is on the line and we bear it. We are the stained glasses that tell the story. Help us to tell it well. It's your name we pray, amen. Thank you for listening to the Encounter Faith Podcast. This podcast is a service of G. Shep Productions from Good Shepherd Lutheran Church in Naperville, Illinois. All rights reserved. If you're in the area, we'd love to meet you on a Sunday morning at our 9 a.m. or 1045 services. At Good Shepherd, we are inviting everyone to walk together in the calling of Christ for a life of eternal impact. This podcast is produced and hosted by me, Ross Cochran. And our theme song is Wake the Earth by 1111 Worship. Thank you for listening. We'll talk again soon.